internet, it's Talbot Sam here again. I'm going to do uh, another video working on the same project as I was in the last one. It's a Playbill poster for a Montreal feeder group. And um, so this topic is going to be the same kind of thing, which is just sort of general advice on inking technique uh, and best practices. Something I always recommend doing before you start working is doing a bit of warming up. Um, it's good for maintaining your skills, but also just when you start drawing or inking or any kind of work, that uh, you're more likely to make mistakes in those first few minutes because you're starting cold. So any kind of basic warm-up exercises, like right now I'm just doing little short, under an inch long feathering lines. Under an inch is relevant because I can just do them with my fingers. So there's longer feathering that I'm now using also my wrist and forearm. And for even longer strokes, I would be using my mostly my shoulder and elbow like this. So then this is going up and away from myself diagonally. So it's mostly the wrist and elbow, the most of the movements in my elbow. The what's happening in my hand is pretty subtle, but I'm keeping the line straight by adjusting the angle. Because normally if I just, just move my elbow, I get a natural curve. And circle practices, so I'm holding the pen directly vertically because the nature of brushes you don't want to push into the brush so to do circles either hold the pen vertically with the brush or you do them in two strokes but I want to do these are small circles larger circles is more again more involving the elbow and shoulder little hatches one thing when you're doing strokes and hatching and stuff like that that unless you're trying to get a weird flicky kind of motion you want to avoid flicking the end of your strokes um, it's something I see a lot of people do to try to add more flourish to their lines but it's not a controlled motion so anything that kind of overly rushes the gesture that you're making isn't going to help the results. Okay. So, a little rotating my wrist. I feel warmed up enough. So the work I'm doing right now, I've already done one tree. Lots and lots of leaves. <laughs> It's uh, definitely repetitive, and I'm keeping it sim simple. The, the leaf form I'm using is very basic. It's just whoop, like that, very simple. Lots of these. You can be more elaborate, but I don't see any good in doing that for this particular project. I'm also going to go over these with wash. Here's, just so you can see, this is what the work I did in the last video ended up looking like once I did the ink wash on them. So the work on the figure is mostly pen. Even where you see thick and thin, that's that's uh, built up with pen work. And then I've done wash work on this, which is actually technically not ink wash, it's watercolor. Black watercolor paint. I use that for wash as well. Um, ink wash is just ink with water in it, diluted, but uh, watercolor paint is sometimes a little easier to use. Uh, I'm using a Pentel pigment pen, pigment brush, uh, and I use a pocket brush. Both of those are permanent inks as opposed to the art uh, Pentel art brush. 
And uh, I do have a Kurataka. Fountain Brush, number eight, I believe. But in it is Platinum Carbon Black, which is a semi-permanent ink. I don't like using water-based inks precisely because I do a lot of ink wash. Uh, someone commented on the last video that they found that the flow on the Pentels was slower. Um, it depends on the ink. I don't find it's too slow for my work, but if it slows down, the way these are designed, I'm not going to do it now because I don't want more ink in my brush, but you squeeze this part very gently. You can actually see when you squeeze it. Not showing right now, but usually you can see in here the ink coming in. And so you can control the flow on the Pentels, any of the ones with a soft handle. Um, there's a couple other brands that make the soft cartridge handle. Um, like I don't like it very much, I found, but uh, what brand was this again? Is this a Kurataka? I forget what brand this was, but this one, it probably says in the handle, but it's in kanji, so I can't read it. Um, this one, I find, uh, it's another, uh, it's called a manga brush, I believe. I find it doesn't have a very good point. So, uh, the ink's nice and black, but the point isn't very sharp. So I use it for filling in stuff while I have it. And then these pens, when they run out of ink, what I've been doing is, I've got one here, there it is. This is an old art brush, so same kind, same brand as the pigment brush, Pentel pigment brush, but these come with a water-based ink, and I tried it out, this was a sepia one. It was pretty good, but I don't use it a lot because it wasn't permanent. I eventually used it all up, and I refilled it with, again, platinum carbon black, which I, I pick up in bottles. It's platinum carbon black. That's a really good fountain pen ink, so it's good for these because these have a fountain pen style feed. You want an ink that won't clog that feed. Uh, India inks and latex based inks will clog it. But most fountain pen inks are uh, water soluble, so they're, they're not permanent. And that doesn't really serve my purposes. But the platinum carbon black I find is semi-permanent. The lines are, are pretty fixed. They don't bleed. They don't run when you get them wet again. The ink is made up of um, fine nanoparticles of carbon. And I do find that it, it releases into the water when you're doing wash. So it'll tint or darken your, your wash or your watercolors. But that's not really a problem for my work. So that'll work. But I really like the ink that comes with the uh, the pigment brush. It's a very nice, strong black ink. And then you can see I've got the fine brush. It's quite thin. And that's excellent for this sort of detail work. So I'm compositing this illustration in, in three parts. The treetops, the, the bottom part, which you just saw. And then you can see a moon here. I'm going to do the background for the entire piece as a wash watercolor piece on a separate layer. And then in Photoshop, I'll, I'll put it all together in layers. And that's partially to make the rendering a little easier. But it's also by design. These, these illustrations are going to be used in the marketing of a play. And I want the parts to be somewhat flexible in layers so they can be rearranged a little bit by the graphic designer. Right now I'm at the top of the tree so the direction of the leaves is all pretty straightforward but you can see in this one that the directions become more random as the leaves are coming down the tree and pointing at us and then I kind of fill in some of the darker areas like here with what's kind of really kind of garbly noise. I'm not trying to render the leaves individually in all cases. But it does take patience. This is a kind of slow, careful work. I wouldn't go so far to say you have to be patient to do comics, but you're gonna have to adopt a, an art style that allows you to be impatient and sloppy if you're not gonna be. 
Um, if you want to do fairly realistic rendering and accomplish all the possible scenarios that you can imagine writing or that writers will write for you, there are going to be a lot of settings and situations which there is no true shortcut. Only patience and time will solve the situation. You notice I'm doing some, some leaves in black here. That'll increase the uh, perception of depth. The shadows of leaves behind. And you'll notice here I'm doing leaves in different directions now that I'm getting into the, the body of the tree. And if you're just catching this video, one of the first examples of my work, just to explain the blue you're looking at is printed. I did the rough drawings on uh, as sketches. Let's see, do I have this one handy? Here's one of the earliest versions of this design. Um, not the one that you see here, but that's one of the, that's the one that had the composition that we went with. I went through a second rough draft and then several digital revisions like making changes in Photoshop to the rough draft to based on notes that I got from the client. And then so once we had a, a rough draft that we all liked that included some coloring just to indicate what was going to happen. I've broken it up and printed it out onto large, in this case, uh, 11 by 14 sheets of smooth Strathmore Bristol. And that's what I'm doing the inking on. And the directionality of the leaves that I'm doing is not totally random. So partially it's based on having spent some time over the years looking at trees and just thinking about how they would hang. If you're not sure what that would look like when you're drawing something, you should look at reference. Absolutely pull up Google image search or go out and look at some real trees if you can. For those that wonder, every once in a while you get this question, no, it isn't cheating. It's a myth that people can draw things without ever having seen them straight from their head. People who can draw straight from their head, is a, that's a talent, but it's not without ever having seen it. It's because they've studied it before. If you haven't studied it, you cannot draw it. Even savants, they have natural drawing ability but their drawings are always a little raw unrefined in technique and they are drawing things that they've seen before not things that they've never seen before they're just somehow able to coordinate and get that thing on the paper a lot of these leaves are gonna be sloppy you know what it really doesn't matter because there are so many of them. It's about the persistence of the pattern and creating a, an impression. No one is going to be checking to see if I did them all perfectly. It would be kind of boring if I did do them all perfectly exact. Nature's not even that perfect. Trust me, go look. You'll find mutant leaves all over the place. And leaves that have been damaged and rotten all kinds of little variations and breaks with consistency
I've got a setup now that lets me record these a lot easier. In the comments, let me know if there's anything about inking that you'd like me to talk about in a future video. And remember that you can sign up to Patreon and become a student patron and get direct feedback to your homework. Send it to me an email. So, taking a break from the leaves to ink branches. And I've at one point mirrored this tree, penciled it once, and then just made small changes in digital form to the pencils. But now I'm hand inking each one separately so that they are actually unique and doing small changes like this branch goes behind that branch, here it's in front. Um, so they'll mirror each other still, but they won't be exact copies. This is uh, not necessary, but again, these are going to be quite large, and I think that uniqueness lends to the end results. My light source is up there, so this side of the branches are getting a heavier line, and this side, catching the light, gets a thinner line. And then I'm just using a little bit of scrubbly hatching to indicate the bark.
Okay, so there we go. Two similar but not identical trees designed to mirror each other but unique. I'm going to now do ink washes on these. So, as mentioned earlier, that was about a, a little over an hour's work, by the way, um, to do all the leaves from when I went into fast forward mode there. I'm going to time lapse a lot of that work after I finished talking a bit about what I was doing. So what I'm doing is I'm using watercolor and I've got a, a water brush here. Sometimes, so in the past I've put ink directly in my water brushes, which is what's happened here. They start off looking like that and then I put ink in these ones. Uh, but this needs to get cleaned out. You can take these apart and clean them out. It's starting to clog. And with this new one that I bought, I'm choosing instead to not put ink in the reservoir and instead just use the ink, the water in it to help dissolve and work with watercolor or ink, in this case watercolor, to stain or ink wash to wash work or my inks here. And this is one of the reasons why I choose in particular to work with like for the, the pigment pen or other permanent inks because if you do this on art that is done with a water-based ink the result is just smudge mess. Also, when you're doing wash, you want to have some toilet paper, or in this case, this is a paper towel handy. And you'll see that I occasionally will daub it if it's getting a little too dark. I'm working on Bristol, which can take a little bit of wetting, but you can't over wet it or work the surface a lot. So you have to be careful, you don't want to use a lot of friction and you don't want to repeat, repeatedly soak it too much. And I'm not trying to be too, too delicate about it, partially because I can go back with white paint and be more precise about edges when I need to. But also this art is going to drop over top of a background that's also ink wash. It'll be the sky with the moon. And that will blend nicely with the rougher edges of my wash work on the leaves. And then I'm going to use, in Photoshop, I'm going to tint the values that I'm creating with this wash. So these, this tree will be sort of a, a muted green, a mottled muted green that will be created by using color and hue overlays and layers in Photoshop. I could do it with color directly on the work, but I never, I'm not especially great with, with watercolors. Uh, so my control over the palette, the colors, it's a bit crude. I find I can get much more consistent results working in tones and then in Photoshop tinting the tones. And that lets me edit the colors a lot more. And with clients who often want to tweak things and modify things, it, it's just generally an easier way to work, I find. And it's, it's more comfortable for me. I do occasionally work directly in full color, usually with watercolors, although I've done acrylic and oil paint as well. Um, but that's for commissions that are going to hang on someone's wall. And I take a lot more time with those. When there's a deadline for the work and I can't fuss over them. Uh, as much anyway. I always fuss over everything, but as much, then I prefer this technique.
also with so many little lines for the leaves and because I actually do want some modeling and different variations in color I don't have to worry about being tidy or getting dark and light patches I actually want that I'm going to try to control it for example I want darker here than out here where the the moonlight is going to be illuminating the leaves a little bit so these will be lighter Whereas I'll go back in a couple of times over the leaves on the other side and make them darker. And yeah, like I might make things a bit modeled in this first pass, but a lot of my darker, more shadowy areas will be achieved by letting this dry a little bit and then going back in again and doing a second pass, building up the tone, building up the values. You could use a dip brush for this kind of work, especially because I'm not putting the, the wash directly in the reservoir of my water brush. I just find this is a very convenient way to work. I've gotten accustomed to working with these brushes. This is a Pentel water brush, and like the Pentel pigment brush and the Pentel pocket brush and art brushes, they make especially good synthetic brush heads. They keep a very nice sharp point. assuming you use it well, which means, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, you don't want to push against, don't push into the brush, always drag the brush away from the tip so that the bristles of the brush are pulling out from the base. If you push into the base, you're going to splay them, you lose your fine control over the tip, and over time you will lose the fine point of the tip, they'll start splitting. That's true with a, a typical dip brush. This is just dry, but if you push it in like as you're working a lot, you'll get more and more bristles that stick out like that. Oh, that, that brush is wet. It will get, return to a bit of a point, but over time, if you damage it too much, it won't do that as, much, as well. And with these synthetic brushes, the same is true. If you bend the bristles, eventually they'll stop making a good point. So pulling sideways like I am is usually okay. So we're going doing diagonally. Pulling down, pushing this way. This is our right. That's bad. That's bad. Again, this kind of tone work that I'm doing with the wash, some might say, oh, I can, you could do that digitally. You could, but you know what? I actually find it takes more time. That could just be me, but my experience is uh, getting the right brush setting and moving around the image in the screen. If you've got a good tablet you're working directly over, it's not bad, but just a lot easier, I find, for the fine motor control to do what I'm doing now. And with no undo setting, I'm not tempted to be overly perfect with it. I just go. I just do it. Um, as I said, like, by design, the little bit that I'm going outside of the lines here won't be a problem because this is going to be going over top of another wash background, so it'll blend together. And, uh... I just find I get things done a lot faster when I work analog as much as possible. And then I really like having the option of digital for compositing, for putting it together and editing it and tweaking it. But my rendering, for me anyway, and of course this is probably partially due to the fact that I learned how to do everything I do 
before doing it all digitally was really a, an option. So it could be a, an age thing. And what you learn first thing. Excuse me. One down. Just quickly throwing in some darker color, darker tone, darker value. Value is the right term. Uh, where it's already starting to dry. There you go. Uh, this one with the gaps is going to be a little more careful work. Oh, kind of some fluff. Having cats, I've always got little bits of cat hair and fluff floating around. I have three cats. One black, one white, one gray. Which ensures that there is no piece of clothing that which cat hair does not show. Notice I'm getting minimal buckling, just a little bit of curvature here, which will actually flatten out when this is dried a fair bit. It's not going to be totally flat, but that's what I was saying before about Bristol being able to take a certain amount of water just fine. If you overwork it, that's when you get it's getting a lot of wrinkles and problems. But uh, Strathmore Bristol, which is a slightly thicker brand, it's um. 100 pound Bristol. This is the 300 series. Holds up very nicely under modest amount of wash work. During this video, you'll have heard like a weird ticking sound because there's freezing rain falling out of that side of my window a few feet away from the microphone. So, sorry if you find that distracting. Can't be helped. Nature has, is having its way. So, partially I'm rotating here to we work on parts without getting my hand in what's already been washed. And I'll avoid dragging your hand through inking and wash work that you've just done so that it doesn't get smeared. And the simplest solution for that often is well, for one thing, to work from your top left corner, if you're right handed like me, to the bottom right. But I didn't do that. <laughs> So instead I'm moving the art around to accommodate. So again, I'm trying to be modestly accurate, but I don't particularly care in this case. There are some situations where I might be more careful, but in this particular case, I don't care if I'm a little outside of the lines because of the nature of the way I'm going to composite the art 
and also just the feeling I want for the final product, which isn't to be overly sharp. I want it to be a little bit organic and loose. Uh, if anything, a risk here would be to become overly rendered and too precise. So small moments of sloppiness within moderation are kind of the look and feel I'm going for. But this particular kind of sloppiness, the way the washes outside of the lines and places, is not something that's going to particularly appear sloppy when it's finished. Just going to give the work a, a slightly more painterly feeling. Anytime you've got too much water beating up on the page, that's when I, I definitely will dab it and help dry things out with a bit of paper towel. Notice that when I dab and I don't rub, that'll smear it and it'll also probably damage the paper. Just a gentle light pressure to soak up the extra water without moving the pigment around. If you push or rub or anything like that, then you're going to end up with a smudge or possibly worse, the paper tearing. The water around and adding extra passes and you'll you'll hear a little bit of friction rubbing. But one thing about what I'm doing here is I'm not I'm not pressing very hard. So again That's a reference to the fact that while you can hear some friction, I want you to take note that pushing harder on the paper is almost never the solution when you're drawing or if you're doing watercolor. It usually doesn't give you good results. There's a very few situations where it's useful. Um, possibly sometimes when you want to get a really particularly dark black out of charcoal but you're also going to create something that's going to smudge like crazy later on. Um, so I would be careful about when you and why you do that and be aware that it, it will have a limited lifespan before it just turns into a, a vague, blurry, mush of powdery coal all over your paper. Um, with wash work and watercolor, Pressing hard with your brush is only going to achieve uh, ultimately damaging the fibers of the paper. So you want to be careful about pushing hard. It won't make it any darker. There's a bit of a sound of friction happening right now, but which I presume this mic, which is quite good, can pick up. But uh, don't mistake that for force. And uh, doing that with a brush will also just achieve smashing the brush into the paper hard and losing all fine control. So the only time I'm doing, you're hearing that the most, is when I'm I am pressing a little bit to get a wider line to use the full width of the brush, cover a larger area quickly. And that creates a little more friction, but I'm careful to do it minimally so that I don't pull up the fibers of the paper. I don't know if you've done something. It appears to be close to finished. So I'm going to stop and Look and take in and catch all the little bits that you may have missed, like these handful of leaves over here. Okay, so I might go do a little bit of, once it's dry, cleaning up slightly with white paint, like right in there where I bled a little extra. Make sure it reads cleanly when I scan it. 
I don't have to do a lot of that because I am going to scan and work this in Photoshop, so there's quite a bit of tidying up that I can do digitally. And I prefer to do that when I can. But I might grab my uh, Presto pen and go in and block out a few spots where I want them to be good and clean and white. And you can see it and do it quickly on the original. That'll save me some time in Photoshop, hunting and pecking with the tools to clean it up there. So, um, remember that you can sign up to my Patreon as a student patron and get feedback on your work directly by sending it to me and also a certain amount of one-on-one -on -one time through video chat or if you happen to be in Montreal, possibly in person. And uh, check out my comics on salgoodsam.com. You can buy physical copies and the physical copies come with digital editions or get digital editions only and also again at the minimal pledge of two dollars on patreon um that doesn't get you to be a student patron but it does get you access to my entire library of independent work via digital download and uh i'll see you next time youtube take care take it easy and have fun doodling <laughs>